Welcome back, Guardians. Today I wanted to cover a topic that I've received many questions about. The Ahamkara, or the Ahamka, which is a Hindu pronunciation, meaning ego. I've previously made a video about the Ahamkara, however that was prior to the Taken King release. The new Grimoire cards, specifically the Book of Sorrows, raise the question, are the Ahamkara in fact the worms? For this topic, I'll provide the evidence for, and then the evidence against the Ahamkara being the same as the worms. The video will end with my own opinion. Thankfully, most of the hard work has already been completed by two very well presented Reddit posts. I will leave links to both posts in the description so you can read them. The argument for the worms being the same as Ahamkara is by Anna Blossom, and the argument against is by Faceless Ruin. I'll also add some of my own evidence that I've not previously seen discussed. Lastly, a warning about the end of the video which discusses some disturbing real world concepts. However, I will give another warning when we are closer to that section. Let's begin with the argument for the Ahamkara are the same as the worms, or at very least the same species. The first piece of evidence that most people stumble upon is the Book of Sorrows verse 1.5, The Needle and the Worm. Sothona, Oryx's sister, gains possession of a white worm. This belonged to her father, the Osmian king. The white worm is dead, however it speaks to her and says, Listen closely, O vengeance mine. The dead worm would later guide the three sisters to discover the ship needle, and consequently lead the sisters to discover their worm gods on the fundament. The dialogue in this verse, O vengeance mine, is the same style of writing of all Ahamkara armour pieces. The young Ahamkara's spine reads, Give me your arm, O bearer mine. Let me help you fill the world with teeth. The clause of Ahamkara says, Look at all this life, O bearer mine. There is so much left to burn. The sealed Ahamkara grasps actually suggest that these are auditory hallucinations. It reads, Plating the Ahamkara bones in silver helps to quiet the auditory hallucinations, O bearer mine. The similarities between the dialogue continues in Book of Sorrows, verse 2.2, Out of the Deep. The verse describes the slaughter of many beings at a location known as Kahan Atoll, and from this the worms are able to cut a wound in space and transport themselves from their planet. The verse ends with, Reality is a fine flesh. O general owls, let us feast of it. Obviously a direct relationship to the flavour text of the skull of Dai Ahamkara. Reality is the finest flesh, O bearer mine, and are you not hungry? Many believe that the similarities in dialogue between the worms and the Ahamkara indicate that they are of the same species. The dead white worm influenced the sisters and their actions, ultimately leading them to discover the worm gods, forming a symbiosis and beginning the never-ending conquest. So you may argue that the Ahimkara pieces are trying to do the same. They speak to us and try to convince us to destroy and burn everything in our path. Whilst the dialogue is an important piece of evidence to support the theory that the Ahimkara are the same as the worms, the physical appearance of the worms can also be used as evidence. Verse 1.9, The Bargain, says this, I am Yal, the honest worm. Behold my passage. Behold my vast displacement, my ponderous strength, my great and coiling length, my folded jaws and curled wings. This dragon-like description, combined with the previous dialogue, led many people to believe that the Ahimkara and the worms were one in the same. Reddit user Alapostolum argues that this further reinforces the translation of worm to the old English spelling worm with a Y, which means dragon. However, completing my own search for this definition of the word worm, many definitions did specify that it means a dragon. However, the definitions also specified it was a dragon without wings or legs, and hence the word was also synonymous with serpent or snake. Now, Destiny does have references to serpents. This is something I discussed in my first Ahimkara video. Regardless, the description of the worms could be easily considered as dragon-like. The third piece of evidence occurs in verse 5.3, I'd shut them all in cells. Zaifu Arath, Oryx's sister, says this, 
The dragons, our gods, should be ours alone. Their smug freedom is an insult to me. I'd shut them all in cells. Bring them to me. Now this can be interpreted multiple ways. To make this sentence support the Ahamkara being the worms, you have to read it in a certain way. The dragons, our gods, should be ours alone. Obviously changing the punctuation changes the meaning completely, however I can see how the sentence can be interpreted this way. It is saying that the dragons are their gods, aka the worms. Later in verse 5.4, the gift mast, it says a species known as the harmony have aligned with the dragons, and the dragons have actually granted them wishes to allow them to fight off the hive. It says this, Turn to dragon wishes, and their wishful bishops wrestles Ifu in the ascendant plane. For most of you, you would assume this would be instantly disproving of the Ahamkara worm theory. If the worm gods are these dragons, then they, why would they empower another race, like the Harmony, to defeat the Hive? Well, it comes back to the overall goal of creating the final form of the universe. The worm gods slash dragons do not really care about the Hive. They only care for the strongest species to continue, to continue to form the perfect universe. However, for this to be true, it would mean that the worm gods slash dragons formed another symbiosis with this other species, the Harmony, where there's actually not much evidence to support this. A large piece of evidence that was not included in the Reddit post, which I believe does give much weight to this theory, is the name of the worms and the name of the Ahimkara. The worm gods are called Akka, Yul, Ia, Zol, and Ur, all of which are short names and most of which are three letter names. You can speculate on two of the names of the Ahimkara. One is Eo, from the bones of Eo, and the other Nyx, from the fang of Nyx. The short three-letter name, similarity, may also be a clue to the connection. I guess, though, if you were to assume this, then you could apply the same assumption to Zer. The last piece of evidence for the argument that the Ahimkara are the worms is that the Ahimkara were known for making bargains with guardians to increase their power and knowledge. The worms also made a bargain. Their bargain was through symbiosis. The general theme of a bargain and granting power may indicate their relationship. So in summary, the Ahimkara talk like, look like, are named like, and make bargains just like the worm gods, hence the evidence they are one in the same. Let's move on to the argument against the Ahamkara being the worm gods. The first piece of evidence is that the worms and the Ahamkara are biologically and structurally different. The Ahamkara armour pieces clearly depict a vertebral animal, whereas assuming the worms are similar to those that we see on the dreadnought, they are invertebrates. Consequently, you can conclude that they are two separate species. However, there is another counter-argument to this, and that is that the Ahimkara bones are not actually the Ahimkara, but just linked with the Ahimkara. I also discussed this in my first video. You may consider the Ahimkara bones like witch doctor or shaman or voodoo bones, enchanted so to speak. However, a counter-argument to the counter-argument would be that the armour pieces does say Ahimkara spine, implying vertebrae. The second piece of evidence would be to address the similarities in dialogue between the worms and the Ahamkara. On this topic, I agree with Reddit user Faceless Ruin. I don't believe the similarities in dialogue proves that they are the same species, but more likely that they worship or are influenced by the deep, the darkness, and all the worms. I will add to this evidence with verse 1.8, Leviathan. In this verse, Sathona says, Let us dive, O sisters mine. She is talking like the worm and the Ahamkara. She has adopted that style of dialogue. Just because she speaks like the dragon and like the worms, it does not mean she is a dragon or a worm. What I believe it indicates is that she has been influenced by the dead white worm, brainwashed almost, to seek out the worm gods and the deep. Remember that the white worm is described as her familiar. The definition of familiar is a demon obeying and attending to a witch. This demon speaks to Sathona, whispers in her ear, and influences her. 
So using this evidence, you would argue that Ahimkara, like Sathona, have been influenced by the worms, to the point where their dialogue is similar. To expand on this, you may speculate that Ahimkara were also infected by the worms. This can be supported by verse 5.3, if you interpret this sentence differently than before. The dragons. Our gods should be ours alone. Their smug freedom is an insult to me. I'd shut them all in cells. Bring them to me. So you could interpret that the Ahimkara, the dragons, has also made a symbiosis with the worms, and hence share the same god with the hive. Zaivu Arath is not happy about this and says, Our gods should be ours alone. The third piece of evidence to disprove that the Ahimkara are the same as the worms is to more closely look at the act of making a bargain. Previously, I mentioned that both Ahimkara and the worms made bargains, hence you could argue that they are the same species. However, you could equally argue that this disproves their relationship. In no Grimo card is Ahimkara mentioned to have formed symbiosis with another species. This is how the worms made their bargain, it was through symbiosis only. Whereas verse 5.4 speaks of dragon wishes, with no mention of symbiosis. In the original cards, there is definitely no mention of the Ahimkara and symbiosis, just plain old bargains. So let's move on to my opinion. It is based upon a portion of evidence that has been overlooked. In verse 5.4, the gift mast, Zaifu Arath battles a harmony who have been empowered by the dragons. The harmony soldiers are called the wish wishful bishops. They fall into a deadlock. Now here is the important part. It says this about Savathun, the cunning sister. She sends units who trick their way into the Anahami in disguises, so that they may vivisect these dragons. The Werma god laughs and laughs. For a hundred years, Savathun keeps secret covens among the Harmony. Eventually the card continues with, Zyphri Arath kills the wishful bishops, and Savathun achieves some secret purpose. So I believe this clue is within the word vivisect. Now here is that warning I spoke about. It gets a bit graphic and feels more realistic because it reflects our own society, so feel free to leave. I was not familiar with this word vivisect until I read the definition of vivisection, and it is quite disturbing. So vivisection means surgery conducted for experimental purposes on a living organism, typically animals with a central nervous system to view living internal structures. Within our society, we have a number of acts, like the Animal Welfare Act, that protect animals from experimentation that causes pain. So scientists cannot cut open a live animal to see how its insides work without first giving it tranquilizers, analgesics, or anesthetics, unless it is scientifically necessary to not give pain relief or tranquilize the animal. Now here's where it gets worse. Also, please be aware I'm not an expert in this era. However, this is my understanding from what I've read. Human vivisection is something that has occurred in our own history, specifically during wars. Prisoners of war were experimented on, cut open, and obviously killed. And these experiments were conducted without anesthesia, so you are conscious and awake, and without analgetic analgesics, pain relief. Right? This is a story of nightmares to be experimented on, tortured whilst being kept alive. You likely have previously heard of Nazi human experimentation and the human experimentation completed as an execution method by the Khmer Rouge. So where am I going with all this? Well, I'm speculating that Savathun, the cunning, succeeded in her experimentation on the Ankara, on the dragons. Quote, Savathun achieves some secret purpose. I believe that the Ahimkara have been infected by the hive, which is a common theme throughout the Book of Sorrows. When the hive cannot beat a species, they say, we will infect their weaknesses. Alternatively, maybe the vivisection of the Ahimkara involved the forceful implantation of a worm. Regardless what Savathun achieved with her vivisection of the dragons, I believe it explains why the Ahimkara speak like the hive. This is why I believe the Ahimkara are not the worms. However, I am keen for your opinion. If you believe the Ahimkara are the worms, then leave the word worms with a Y in the comments. If you agree with me, leave the word dragon in the comments. 
Once again, it's been a pleasure to speak with you all. This is Marlon Games, and I'll see you next time. Peace.